Okay, welcome back everyone. Good morning. So, one more week until Flex Week, where you guys can slow down a little and catch up on things that you've missed um, and work on your assignment. So, what are we talking about today? So today we're going to finish up talking about the graph representations uh, that we started last week. And then we'll talk about a interesting topic called graph traversal and look at breadth first search and depth first search. Okay, so on Thursday when we left off, we had just finished looking at the adjacency matrix representation. And now we're going to look at the adjacency lists representation. All right, so what is the adjacency list representation? Um, it's a representation where we have an array of lists, right? an array of linked lists, one for each vertex, and for each list, so for list zero, for example, that list contains the neighbors of vertex zero, right? and list one contains the neighbors of vertex one, list two contains the neighbors of vertex two, and so on. So we can see here, for example, in this graph, right, list zero, so this is, uh, in the list at index zero of this array, we have the vertices one and three, right? And that's because uh, vertex zero's neighbors are one and three, okay? And so on for the remaining vertices, right? So for example, three's adjacency list contains the vertices zero, one, and two because these are the neighbors of vertex three. Okay, and with the adjacency list, you see the same kind of symmetry that you see with adjacency matrices, right? So since this top graph here is undirected, um, if two vertices are connected by an edge, so for example, zero and one, right? One will appear in zero's adjacency list and zero will appear in one's adjacency list, okay? But the same is not necessarily true for directed graphs, right? So in this graph here, one has an edge to three, but not the other way around. So three will appear in one's adjacency list, but one doesn't appear in three's adjacency list. Okay, so that's the adjacency list representation. So here is how we would represent it in our code. Okay, so this, so we see the same fields as before, number of vertices, number of edges, but this field here is a pointer to an array of linked lists, right? So here is our linked list node, right? struct edge node. Each node contains a vertex and a pointer to the next node. And one adjacency list is, has type struct edge node star, right? Because that's one pointer to a um, node. So the first node in the list, right? So in order to have an array of these linked lists, we have a double pointer, right? Each of these is a pointer to a struct edge node, right? each of these array elements. And in order to have a pointer to an array of these, right, we need a pointer to a pointer. So struct edge node star star. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the time complexity of the operations here. So in order to create the adjacency list representation when we're creating a new graph, right, all we need to do is to malloc this struct over here and also malloc an array of pointers. Right? Initially, there aren't going to be any edges, so all of these pointers will be null. Right? So that means since we're mallocing a struct of constant size and we're mallocing an array of size v, right, the time complexity of creating this representation will be big O V, right? Okay, and how about, um, how about inserting an edge, right? So if we wanna insert an edge between U and V, right? That means we wanna insert a new node containing V into U's adjacency list, right? And we need to insert a node containing U into V's adjacency list, right? So we're going to need to look at two of these adjacency lists and insert a node into each, 
OK? But we also want to make sure that since this is an undirected graph, right, and we don't have any duplicate edges, we want to make sure that the edge doesn't already exist, right? So essentially, we just need to loop through the list to make sure it doesn't already contain the edge. OK, and how long can a list, an adjacency list, be in an undirected graph? If we have V vertices, how long can one of these lists be at most? V minus one. Yeah, V minus one, yeah. Right, that's because a node can be adjacent to all the other nodes. That would be V minus one other nodes, right, but not itself. So maximum length would be V minus one. And that means in order to go through the list, that would be big O of V. So inserting an edge is big O of V in the worst case. Um, and so is deleting an edge, right? If we delete an edge from a graph, then that, you know, we need to delete from two adjacency lists, right? We need to delete one node from each. And also um, these lists can be up to V minus one nodes long. Right? So deleting an edge is also big O of V. Okay, and what other operations do we have? Checking if an edge exists, right? If we wanna check if an edge exists using this representation, then we need to go through the list, right, for one of the vertices. So if we wanna, for example, check if U and V are connected via an edge, then we can either look through U's list or we can look through V's list, right? If it's an undirected graph, then we can look through one of those two lists, okay? And that will also be big O of V in the worst case, right? Because the length of list is at most uh, V minus one nodes long, okay? So yeah, those are our three main operations. So I'll just show you guys the code quickly. So graph edge list. Okay, so here is our graph new function creating a graph, right? So what we are doing here is malloking a node, sorry, malloking a struct containing um, the number of vertices, number of edges, and a pointer to an array. Then we malloc that array, or we calloc it. So we allocate an array of the vertices. Um, we're using calloc here, which initializes all the memory to zero. That means all the pointers will be null. All right, and we initialize a couple of fields here. Okay, uh, graph free. So we didn't talk about graph free um, earlier, but in order to free a graph, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to need to uh, free up all the nodes that represent each of the edges, right? So that's going to be O of E at least. Um, and we also need to free this array, right? And we need to free this um struct here, okay? So in order to free all of this, it's gonna be bigger of V plus E, right? Because we, first of all, we, knew, we do need to loop through this array, right? In order to free all the edges and freeing all, so that'll be O of V and then freeing all these nodes would be O of E, okay? So graph three would be bigger of V plus E. Num vertices, num edges are bigger of one. So is adjacent, so checking if two vertices are connected is big O of V in the worst case. So I already explained that. And insert and remove are also big O of V, okay? So I'll leave these uh, coding exercises up to you because the lab this week does have some similar um, tasks. So I'll leave this unimplemented. Okay, so what are the advantages of an adjacency list? So it's more space efficient than an adjacency matrix if our graph is more sparse, right? In the real world, most graphs are sparse, so an adjacency list representation would be more suitable in most cases. Um, and it uses big O of V plus E memory, okay? Because O of V space for the array and O of E space for all the nodes. Okay, and what's the main disadvantage of an adjacency list? So the main one is that inserting or deleting an edge is big O of V, right? Which is not as efficient as an adjacency matrix, right? In the adjacency matrix, 
inserting or removing an edge was 01. Right, but this matters less for sparse graphs, right? Because if you have a sparse graph, then the length of each linked list, adjacent to the list, isn't going to be very long, right? So, so an adjacency list is still the preferred representation for um, most scenarios in the real world. Okay, so let's talk about the last representation, which is, <coughs> um, which is kind of underrated. So it's a very simple data structure. Uh, so it's called array of edges. Okay, so in this representation, we simply store all the edges explicitly, right? So we store um, each edge as a pair of vertices, right? So it just could be a struct containing two vertices. Um, so for example, here, uh, if we have an undirected graph, then what we could do is just store each of these arrays, oh, sorry, each of these edges once right, in the array. So for example, if there's an edge between zero and one, so we store a pair of vertices zero and one in our array. Right? And same for the other um, edges. Okay, if we have a directed graph, then, um, then this might seem odd because we have more edges in this array over here, but that's because the graph is directed, right? So we have to store um, each edge uh, in one direction, right? So for example here, uh, because we have an edge from zero to one and also an edge from one to zero, we store each of these uh, separately in the array, okay? So edge from zero to one, edge from zero to three, one to zero, one to three, and three to two. Okay, so here's how we would represent the array of edges uh, in C. Okay, so our graph struct now contains an array of struct edges, right, where each struct edge contains two vertices, U, uh, V and W. And we also store a field here called max E, so that represents the actual size of the array, right? So how many edges could this array possibly contain, so that if the array gets full later on, we can resize it and then set this max E to be a larger size, okay? So that's the implementation. So now if we were to think about how efficient this representation is, right? So if we want to create this representation, um, then how efficient would that be? Well, we would have to allocate a um, graph struct, right? So we have to allocate this. And let's say that whenever we initialize our graph, we allocate a array of fixed size, right? Of a small size, and then we're going to uh, resize it later on if we need to, right? So creating this uh, representation is gonna be 01, right? So just allocating this struct and a small fixed size array. How about, um, how about freeing the graph? So if you want to free the graph, then all we're doing is just freeing this pointer over here, right? this pointer to the array, and also freeing the struct, so that'll be O1 as well. How about inserting an edge? So, so the problem with inserting right, is that we have to make sure that the graph, uh, that the edge that we're trying to insert doesn't already exist in the array. Right? So, that means we'd have to search through the array. So that could be big O of V uh, if we perform a linear search, or if we can somehow make the array ordered, then we can perform a binary search, right? And that would be log N, right? But remember each of those has its downsides, right? If the array is unordered, then we have to perform a linear search. Um, if the array is ordered, we, have to, we can perform a binary search, but inserting the edge into the array means we have to shift the edges so that the array remains ordered, right? So either way, inserting an edge is going to be bigger of V, okay? Oh, sorry, bigger of E, where E is the number of edges, right? Okay, and same thing for deleting an edge, right? So that will also be bigger of E, and checking if two vertices are connected or adjacent, 
So if our array is ordered, right, then we can make that a log E operation. Okay. okay, so let me show you guys this representation. So here, okay, so creating a new graph is big O of one. All right, so freeing is also big O of one because we're just calling free twice. Number of vertices, number of edges are O1. And here, a graph is adjacent, so here we're actually just doing a linear search, right? But if you make the array ordered, then you could perform a binary search. Okay, and same for insert edge and remove edge. So these two will be big O of V no matter whether the array is um, ordered or not. Okay. Okay, so what is the main advantage? So if the, if the graph is very, very sparse, so E is less than V, so for example, maybe you, have, you could have hundreds of thousands of vertices or millions of vertices, but the graph actually has very few edges, um, then the array of edges representation uh, will be very space efficient right? because you don't need to have one pointer for each vertex, right, as we needed with the JCC list, right, we just store the edges. So if you have very few edges but very many vertices, then uh, we can save a lot of space there. Right. What's the main disadvantage? So the main disadvantage is inserting or deleting an edge is going to be inefficient, right, because, because of what I mentioned earlier. So you need to either shift the array if the array is ordered, or you need to perform a linear search if the array is unordered. All right, so big O of E. All right, and here is the summary of our representations. All right, so we can see that adjacency matrix takes up a lot of space, right, O of V squared space. Uh, adjacency list takes up less space, V plus E, and array of edges takes even less space, big O of E. It depends on, so the actual space usage depends on how sparse the graph is, right? So if the graph is very dense and there are lots of edges, then a agency matrix might uh, be the better choice. Okay. Yeah, and a special note here is that for the array of edges, so I mentioned earlier that if your array is ordered, array of edges is ordered, then you can perform a binary search, right? And that would make adjacency checking uh, log E in the worst case. Okay, so any questions about these representations before we move on to our next topic? Okay, so if not, we'll head over and look at graph traversal. All right. Fun topic. Okay, so graph traversal. So what is graph traversal all about? So it's going to help us solve lots of different kinds of problems on graphs. So here are just some of them. So is there a path between two vertices, right? That's a really common problem, right? We just wanna know if we can get from one place to another. Well, what is the shortest path between two vertices? Is the graph connected, so remember, what does connected mean? That means uh, for every pair of vertices in a the graph, there is a path between them. Okay, so if we remove an edge, is the graph still connected? And so on. Okay, so we're going to solve most of these problems uh, in the next few lectures. Right, and we're going to solve them using a method called graph traversal. Right, so what's graph traversal? It's just a systematic way of exploring a graph via its edges, okay? So, so for example, starting from a given vertex, we wanna explore all of the vertices from that vertex. That's one example of a graph traversal, right? And we wanna use the edges so that we can make sure, you know, so, so that we can use the traversal to find a path, right? If you just explore the vertices in a random order, then we wouldn't be able to use it to find a path necessarily. 
Okay. Cool. So here is one example of a problem that we're going to solve. Right. So is there a path between two vertices, source and destination? Right. So one way of doing this is to examine. So given the starting points, we're going to examine all of the vertices adjacent to the starting point. Right. So from the starting point, what edges are there? So we're going to take each of those edges and look at where those lead to. And if any of these vertices is our destination, then we're done, right? Because we found our destination. Right? If neither, if none of those edges, none of those vertices is our destination, then we're going to check the vertices two edges away. So we take, so we go to each of those vertices and then we look at the edges from those vertices and we see if any of the vertices that those edges lead to is our destination and so on. Right, so we just keep looking further and further away from the source vertex until we find our destination. Right, and this is actually one form of graph traversal called breadth first search. Right, so here are the two methods for graph traversal. So they're called breadth first search and depth first search. Okay, and here is like a high level description of the behavior, I guess. So BFS prioritizes visiting the neighbors over following a path, right? And DFS prioritizes path following over visiting neighbors, right? So in order to explain the difference, suppose you know, you're walking down the road and you reach a fork in the road, right? And there are you know, three different roads you can go down, right? And each of those roads leads to another fork in the road and so on, right? So what BFS does is how, so if you do a BFS, what you're saying is, all right, I'm gonna go down each of these roads to the next fork, right? So I'm gonna go down one of the roads, then I'm gonna come back, go down the other road, come back, go down the other road, and come back, right? And once I've gone down each of these roads to the next fork, then I'm going to go one step further, right down each of the forks um, that these roads lead to, right? So we'll go down two roads down, right, for each possible road, and so on. So we're gradually going further and further away from where we started. Right, if we do a DFS, then what we're going to do is we're going to go down one road, right, go to that fork, see which roads there are, choose one of those roads and go down that road, and we're gonna keep going until we reach a dead end, right? And if we reach a dead end, then we're going to come back and go down another road that we haven't gone down before. And, and, and that's called a depth first search, right? So we're going down one road as far as we can until we reach a dead end and then backtracking. Okay. So let's look at uh, an example of the difference between these two. So suppose we have this graph. So how would BFS um, visit the vertices. So what order would it visit the vertices? So supposing, uh, so here is how BFS um, would visit the vertices, right? So starting from A, we're going to visit B, C, and D, right? In some order. So here we're just assuming that if we have multiple neighbors, we're going to visit the lower letter vertices first, right? So we'll visit B, C, and D. Then we're going to visit E, then G, then I, right? So these are the vertices that are two steps or two roads away. Then we're going to visit F and H, right, which are three roads away. All right, so if we do a depth first search, <coughs> then at each point, we're just going to choose a road and go down that road, right? So for example, we'll, we start at A, then we go to B, right? Then B has a road to C, so we go down that road. Then C has a road to D, so we go down that road. Oops, then D, from D we go to I. Then since I has dead ends, we go back to D. D doesn't have any other roads. Um, so then we go back to C, right? C has a road to G, so we go down that road. Then we go to F, then E. Then E is a dead end, right? Because we've already gone to B before, so we backtrack to G, and we go to H. Okay, so that's how depth first search would behave. Okay, so let's start by looking at breadth-first search. 
Okay, so from what I described before, where we see that breadth first search visits the vertices in order of distance from the starting vertex. Right, so it first visits the starting vertex, then all the vertices that are one edge away, right, the neighbors, then the neighbors of those vertices, and so on. Okay, and we implement BFS using a Q. Okay. So, in order to implement a BFS, what do we need? So what data structures do we need? So first of all, we need a visited array, right? So this visited array allows us to keep track of what vertices have been visited, right? Because the problem with graphs, right, is that they have cycles, right? So if we go around a cycle, right, we don't wanna revisit the vertices that we've already been to before, so. We use a visit array to keep track of what we've already visited. Right. Okay. Uh, we also use a predecessor array. Okay. So the predecessor array we're going to use to keep track of the predecessor of each vertex. Right. So uh, the predecessor is just the vertex. So the predecessor V is the vertex that. Um, so the vertex that I used to get to V, right? So it's the vertex from which we reached V, right? So for example, if I'm at U, vertex U, and I look at all the edges, and I see that there's an edge to vertex V that I haven't visited before, then the predecessor of vertex V will be vertex U, okay? Okay, and we're going to use the predecessor array in order to rebuild the path to each vertex at the end of the BFS. Okay. And um, we also use a queue. So, so we've seen queues before. Right? Q is a first in, first out data structure. And the purpose of the queue is to, to store the vertices that uh, we haven't visited yet, right? in the order that they should be visited. Okay, so here is the, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the queue starts off empty, and as we explore more and more of the graph, we're going to enqueue the vertices. So we're going to. So in the algorithm, we start by enqueuing the source vertex, the starting vertex, right? And for each of the vertices adjacent to the starting vertex, we're going to enqueue those vertices. So put those on the queue. And one at a time, we're going to remove these vertices from the queue to explore them, okay? So uh, to explain that, here's the algorithm. Okay, so with our algorithm, first we need to create and initialize our data structures. Right, so at the start, we're going to have a visited array where everything is false, right? Because we haven't visited any of the vertices yet. Right, we're also going to create a predecessor array initialized to minus one, right? And the reason we initialize the array to minus one is because if we initialize them to zero, well, zero is a vertex number, right? So we don't wanna um, set the predecessor to an ambiguous value, right? Which could either mean, so if we initialized everything to zero, then does the zero mean that we haven't, you know, visited the vertex yet, or does it mean that the predecessor is vertex zero? So uh, there's some ambiguity there. So we initialize it to minus one. Uh, we also create an empty queue. Okay, so next, um, in BFS and DFS, we always have a starting vertex, so we will mark the starting vertex as visited and then queue it. Right. Now, after that, we enter the main loop of our algorithm. Right. So in this main loop, we're going to keep going while the queue is not empty, right? because the queue contains the vertices that we haven't visited yet. Right. And inside this loop, we're going to first dequeue a vertex Right, so remove the vertex from the queue, and then we're going to explore that vertex. Right, so for each of the vertices' neighbors, 
right? If the neighbor hasn't been visited, then we're going to mark it as visited, right? Then we will set its predecessor, then enqueue that vertex. Okay, so let's show, let's go through an example of BFS. Okay, so here's our graph, and we're going to do a BFS starting from vertex zero. Okay, so first thing we will do is to create and initialize our um, data structure, so our visited array. So here the zero means false, okay? The predecessors are all minus one, and the queue is empty. Right. And first thing we do is to enqueue zero and mark it as visited. Right. So that's what we're doing. So we mark zero as visited and we enqueue it. And then we enter our main loop. Right. So in our main loop, what do we do? We dequeue the vertex from the front of the queue. Right. So we dequeue zero. And now we explore zero. Right. So the neighbors of zero are one, two, and five. Right, so we'll look at each of these in turn. So for vertex one, vertex one hasn't been visited yet, right? Because it's still zero in the visited array. So we're going to mark it as visited, set its predecessor to zero, right? Because that's the vertex we're currently exploring, and we're going to enqueue it. So that's what happens for vertex one. For vertex two, right, vertex two also hasn't been visited yet. So we're going to visit it, uh, mark, uh, set its predecessor to zero, and also enqueue it. Right, and same thing for vertex five. Right, so five hasn't been visited, so we mark it as visited. Here we set its predecessor to zero, and we enqueue it. Okay, so. Now we're done with exploring vertex zero, okay? So next, so here's our next iteration of our loop, right? We're going to DQ one, right? And what are the neighbors of vertex one? The neighbors are zero and five, right? So zero has already been visited, right? So we pretty much just ignore it, right? But five, has also been visited, right? So we ignore that as well. Okay, and now we're done with exploring one. So when we explored one, there was nothing to actually do. All right, next we DQ two. Right now two has neighbors zero and three, and we haven't explored three yet, but we have already explored zero, so we kind of skip zero. Now with three, we're going to mark three as visited. We set its predecessor to two, right? Because two is the vertex that we are currently at. And we add three to our cube, okay? So like that. Okay, and that's now uh, we're done with exploring two. All right, next let's uh, DQ five and explore five. Now five has lots of neighbors, right? Zero, one, three, four, six, and seven. Uh, but since we've already explored zero, one, and three, we can skip all of these. So zero has been visited, one's been visited, and three's been visited. So next, um, we're going to deal with four. Right now, four hasn't been visited, so we mark it as visited. We set its predecessor to five, and we in Q four. Right, and same thing for six and seven. Right, so for six. We set its predecessor to five, we enqueue it. And for seven, we set its predecessor to five, and we enqueue it. Okay, next, we DQ three. Right now, three's neighbors have all been visited already, so we do nothing for each of those vertices, right, and we're done with exploring three. So nice and simple. Next, we DQ four. Right, and four has these neighbors, three, five, seven, and eight. And now three and five have already been visited, and so has seven, right? So, so skip these vertices, and now vertex eight has not been visited, so we're going to mark this visited, set its predecessor to four, right, and enqueue it. Okay, now let's 
explore 6, right? dq6 and explore it. Now 6 only has one neighbor, which is 5, and 5 has been visited already. So we skip it, and we're done with 6. Okay, next, 7. So 7 has these neighbors, 4, 5, 8, 9. Right, 4, 5, and 8 have been visited already, but 9 has not. Right, so we set 9's predecessor to 7, right, and we add it to the queue. Okay, next we remove 8. Right now, 8's neighbors have already been visited, all of them, so we skip all of these. And finally, we DQ 9, and 9's neighbors have also already been visited. Okay, so we're done with 9, and now our queue is empty. Right, so that means our BFS is finished. Okay, and what has this given us? Well, first of all, we are given how many, so we know which vertices have been visited. Right, so uh, this can be useful because if you have another set of vertices which aren't connected to these ones, right, so which aren't in the same connected components as these vertices over here, then the visited array will be able to tell us that. Right? Now the predecessor array is going to let us reconstruct the paths from the starting vertex, which is zero, to each of these vertices. Right? So, so let's go back to here. So this is our finished, um, so finished BFS. And another thing to notice is that um, we explored the vertices in order of distance from the starting vertex, right? So we initially explored zero, then we explored one, two, and five, which are the neighbors of zero. Then we explored three and four and six, which are the neighbors of those neighbors. Then we explored seven and eight, right, which are three, um, wait, no, so we explored three, four, six, and seven, which are all two edges away. Then we explored eight and nine, which are three edges away. Right, and here is the pseudocode for BFS. Right, so this is pretty much just following the algorithm here. Right, so initialize our data structures, then visit the starting vertex and enqueue it, then the loop where we dequeue, and then we explore the vertex by looking at all of its neighbors. Okay. Okay, so here's the pseudocode. Um, but it turns out that we can simplify this a little bit. Um, it turns out that we don't need the visited array in this case, right? And that's because every time we um, mark a vertex as visited, we are also setting its predecessor, right? So we always do both these at the same time, right? So we can actually just use the predecessor array to tell us which vertices have been visited or not, right? Because at the start, we initialize the predecessor array to minus one, right? So that we can use that to um, infer that the vertex hasn't been visited, right? So if the predecessor is minus one, that means V hasn't been visited. If it's some other vertex number, then we know that V has already been visited before, right? So here's a simpler version of the pseudocode, right? So we don't have a visited array here. Here we just have a predecessor array. Okay. And in order to check if a vertex hasn't been visited, we check if the predecessor of the vertex is still minus one. Okay. So, so what is the, the time complexity of BFS? So, if we use the adjacency list representation, uh, which is the representation that we're going to use um, throughout this lecture and also in the next lecture, um, then BFS is going to be O of V plus E. Okay, so why is it bigger of V plus E? Um, first of all, we need to think about how efficient our Q is, right? Because we're using a Q ADT, so, um, so a typical Q implementation is O of one, right, for each of these 
operations in queuing and dequeuing, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, and what else does the algorithm do? Right, so the algorithm does, in the worst case, it's going to explore every vertex, right? So that means each vertex is going to go in the queue and go out of the queue. So that's going to contribute a cost of V, right, or O of V. And furthermore, for each of these vertices, we're going to consider all of their edges, right? So if we take the number of edges that each vertex is connected to and add them all up, right, that's going to be E, right, or O of E. Right, so what we're doing is essentially we're taking this loop here, uh, which iterates over the edges of one of the vertices, and we're summing up the cost across all of the vertices. Right? So the total cost um, for all the times that this loop runs will be O of E. Okay? So the total cost is O of V plus E. Okay, so now um, we can take this um, pseudocode and implement it. So how would implementing BFS look like? Okay, so here is some starter code. Right, so we have in this file here, graph private.h, we have our structs for the adjacency of this representation, right? And now I want to implement BFS here. Okay, so let's implement the simplified version where we don't have a visitor array. So I'll just comment this out. Right, and let's remind ourselves what we need to do. Right, so first of all, we need to initialize our predecessor array so that um, all of the predecessors are minus one. Okay, so I'll loop through the array and set everything to minus one. Okay, and in order to uh, finish the initialization, I need to mark the starting vertex as visited. Right, so to do that, I'll just set the predecessor of the starting vertex to itself. Right, that's fine, it doesn't matter because it's the starting vertex. Right, and we'll also in queue the starting vertex. Right, so here I'm just going to use the queue in queue function. To in queue the starting vertex. Right, so if you want to see what the queue ADT looks like, it's pretty much the same functions as we talked about two weeks ago. So let's go back to bfs.c. All right, so we finished our initialization. That means now we're going to implement our main loop, right? So while the queue is not empty. Right, so let me check what new functions are provided here. All right, so there's a queue size function, so let's use that. So while the size of the queue is greater than zero, so while it's not empty, what do we do? So first step um, inside the main loop is to dequeue a vertex, right? So the way we do that is, well, vertex v equals q dq. So we call the dq function for the q. Okay, and now we're going to explore v, right? That means for each of the edges of v, we're going to, if the vertex hasn't been visited yet, we're going to mark it as visited and enqueue it, okay? So uh, since this is an adjacency list representation, I'll create a current pointer to the adjacency list for B. So G 
edges v. Okay, and now we're going to loop through this list. Right, so let's use a for loop. So for so current is not null and current equals current next. Right now, each of these nodes is going to contain a neighbor of v. Okay, so I'm going to uh, so I'm going to go and access the field v in the adjacency list node. Right, so if we go back to graph private.h, right, the field um, for each neighbor is called v in the adjacency node. So, so current arrow v. Right. And now we're going to check if v has already been visited yet or if it's not been visited yet. So how do we do that? Well, we look at the predecessor array. Right, so if the predecessor is minus one, if right, the predecessor of w is minus one, that means w hasn't been visited yet. So w hasn't been visited. Right, then what do we do? Well, we set the predecessor. So we set this predecessor to v, right, because that's the vertex we are currently exploring, and we enqueue it. Okay, so there is our main loop. Okay, and what I'm going to do is print out each vertex as it is dequeued, so we know what order we are exploring these vertices. Okay, so print um, v, print out v. And at the end, I'm going to just print out a new line. Okay, so let's now compile this. Okay, so in my test graph file, I've just created a graph, the same graph as in the lecture slides, and I run a BFS starting from vertex zero. Okay, so if I run this, hopefully we should get the same output um, as um, our slides, right? So in our slides, our visit order was 0, 1, 2, 5, 3, 4, right? So 0, 1, 2, 5, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so we get the same order. Okay, so there's BFS, right? Now, we want to use the BFS in order to find a path, right, between two vertices. So after we finish the BFS, how do we actually reconstruct the path? Right, so we use the predecessor, right? right? So, so it turns out that the BFS lets us find the shortest path, right, between the starting vertex and all the other vertices. Um, so in order to actually find this path, we're going to backtrace through the predecessor array, right? Because the predecessor array tells us the previous vertex, right, for each vertex. So in order to find the path from source to destination, we start at the destination, we look at what its predecessor is, right? And then for that vertex, if that vertex isn't the starting vertex, then we look at the predecessor of that vertex, and so on until we get back to the store, the source. Okay, so here is uh, our predecessor array from the BFS, and suppose we want to find the shortest path from zero to eight. Okay, then what do we do? We start from our destination eight, right, and we look at its predecessor. Right, so eight's predecessor is four. That means that on the path from zero to eight, the vertex just before eight is going to be four. Right, then we look at four's predecessor, right, well, four's predecessor is five. So that means um, on the path to, uh, so the vertex just before four on this path is going to be five, right, and now five's predecessor is zero. 
So zero is our starting point, so our path is zero, five, four, eight. Okay, so notice that there is another, there is actually another path right, of the same length, which goes zero, five, seven, eight, uh, but this just gives us one of the paths. Okay. Cool, so that's how we find a path using BFS. Right? And here is the code that would let us do that. Right? So first of all, you'd run your BFS. Right? And after the BFS is done, you now check your predecessor array. Right? So if the predecessor of your destination is still minus one, that means we weren't able to visit that vertex during our BFS, that means we can't actually reach it. Right, but if the predecessor isn't minus one, uh, that means we can reach the destination. And what do we do? We start at the destination, right? So V equals dest. And then we backtrace through the predecessor array, right? So while the vertex isn't the starting vertex, we're going to print out the vertex, right? And then we're going to set V to its predecessor, right? V equals predecessor V. Okay, so let's now go over to our BFS again. And um, implement the path binding. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll grab all of these lines and copy them over. Okay, and I'll put it in this function over here. All right, let's get rid of this stuff. Okay, so first of all, we need to run our BFS, right? But after we've run our BFS, we can now print out our path. Okay, so first of all, check if the predecessor is not minus one. If it's not minus one, then that means it is possible to reach the destination from the starting vertex. Right, then we're going to create a variable um, called, so here it's called V, but let me just call it um, current okay, so current equals destination and then we're going to backtrack through our predecessor array right, so what does that look like so while current is not source let's print out our vertex and also just an arrow right, and then we're going to set current to its predecessor now, at the end, uh, we print out the starting vertex. All right, and that should be it. Okay, so now if I compile this, um, okay, so first I have to edit this file so that we actually are trying to find a path from zero to eight. Right, and hopefully we're going to get the same outputs as this, right? So zero, five, four, eight. Except it's gonna be printed from right to left. Right. So let's run it. Right, so zero, five, four, eight. Okay. Cool, so this pseudocode works, right? And that's BFS. Right. So that's how we perform a BFS and that's how we find the shortest path from the starting vertex to any other vertex in the graph. All right, so does anyone have any questions about BFS? Okay, so if not, we'll take a five minute break and then we'll go on and look at our next traversal method, which is DFS. Okay.
Okay. Okay, so we are back. And let's start looking at DFS, which is depth first search. Okay, so, right, so here is depth first search. Right, and how do we describe depth first search? So depth first search sort of goes down one path as far as it can, right, until it reaches a dead end. And once it reaches a dead end, it backtracks and finds another path to take, then goes down that path as far as it can until it reaches a dead end and then backtracks and it repeats. Okay, so that's how DFS works. And the really nice thing about DFS is that we can implement it recursively or iteratively. So we can show how we can use recursion on graphs, okay? Which will be very interesting. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the recursive solution, um, which is really cool because of how elegant it is. Um, but here is the description, right? So first of all, we do need a visited array, right? Just like with BFS, so you know, can't get rid of that, but we create a visited array, and then um, we will start at a particular vertex, right? And if the vertex, so the process is we mark the current vertex as visited, right? And then for each neighbor of the current vertex, um, if the neighbor hasn't been visited yet, we're going to recursively traverse from that vertex, all right? And that's it, that's recursive DFS, right? And the really cool thing about this is that it allows us to uh, produce backtracking behavior, right? So I already said earlier that DFS does backtrack, right, if it reaches a dead end, uh, but the recursion allows us to actually, um, it naturally produces that backtracking behavior, right? So I might show that when we implement this up. All right, and here's the pseudocode for DFS, right? So look at how elegant it is, really, right? So in the DFS function, we create our visited array, right, initialize it to false, right? Then we call our recursive helper function, right? In our recursive helper function, we set vertex V to visited, right? So vertex V is the current vertex. We set that as visited. Then for each neighbor, of the vertex V. If that vertex hasn't been visited yet, then we recurse from that vertex, right? And that's it. Okay, so here is an example. Okay, so same graph, uh, but this time we are doing a DFS. Right, and on the right here, since we're using recursion, I'm going to uh, have a um, diagram showing the core stack. So there's going to be a column of function cores over on the right. Okay, so since we're starting at zero, uh, we're going to have this function on the core stack. Right, now, what are zero's neighbors? So zero's neighbors are one, two, and five, right? So we're going to pick one here, since one is the smallest vertex number. And we're going to um, so, well, first of all, we mark zero as visited, uh, but then we're going to pick one. Right now, one hasn't been visited, so we're going to recurse into one. All right, so we're not even considering two and five here. We're just taking one and recursing into it. Then from one, where we mark that as visited, then one has a neighbor five, which hasn't been visited, so we recurse into five. What next? Well, five has neighbors, or well, we mark five as visited, then five has a neighbor three, right, which has to be visited, so we recurse into three, right? Then what do we do in DFS three? Well, we mark three as visited, then three has a neighbor two, which hasn't been visited, so we're going to recurse into two, right? Now we mark two as visited, right? But what do we do now? Both of our neighbors have been visited, right? So here is when we backtrack, right? So what do we do? We return from DFS2, and now we're back in DFS3, right? As we see from the core stack, right? DFS3, core DFS2, 
That means when DFS2 returns, we return to DFS3. And that's where the backtracking happens, right? When the function returns and returns to a previous, uh, previous instance of the function, right? So now we're back in DFS3. Right now, DFS3 still has another neighbor, four, which hasn't been visited. So we're going to recurse into four now. Right, and the way we do, we mark four as visited. Four has neighbor seven, which hasn't been visited. So we recurse into seven. Now we mark seven as visited. Eight, uh, seven has a neighbor eight, which hasn't been visited. So we recurse into eight. Right, then eight, we mark as visited. 8 has a neighbor 9, which hasn't been visited, so we recurse into 9. Right, then from 9, we mark 9 as visited. Right, and now since 9 is a dead end, right, both of its neighbors have been visited, we return. Right, so we return to DFS 8. Now since 8 has no more neighbors that haven't been visited yet, we return again to 7, then we return to 4, then 3, then 5. Right, now five still has one more neighbor which hasn't been visited, which is six. Right, so we recurse into six. And we mark six as visited. Right? And now there are truly no more vertices to visit. So we will end up just returning, backtracking all the way back to zero. And we are done. Okay. Okay, so there is our DFS. And here is the order that we visited all the vertices, right? So zero, one, five, three, two, right? So notice that we are going down one path as far as we can until we reach a dead end. Then we are backtracking, right? So we would backtrack to three, right? Then, so the, the backtracking isn't actually shown in the visit order. So here we're just listing out, you know, all the vertices in the order that were, that were visited, but we backtrack to three, then we go to four, seven, eight, nine, then we backtracked all the way to five, then we visited six, okay? So that is um, the behavior of recursive DFS, okay? So let's implement this now, right? And you'll be able to see just how, you know, elegant it is, okay? So, in this function, what do we need to do? Uh, we need to create a visited array. Right, so let's do that. So calloc an array of size nv. And each of these array elements is a boolean. Right, so size of bool. Right, and we'll just skip the error checking here. Um, but now we're going to call our helper function. Right? So the helper function takes in the graph, takes in the starting vertex, right? and it also takes in the visited array. Right? And after this helper function is done, we'll free the visited array. Okay, now all we have to do is to implement this helper function. So this function, remember, takes in a graph, takes in the current vertex V, and takes in the visited array. Okay, and what does the function do? So first, it visits the vertex V, right? So, oops, visit V equals true. And I'm also gonna print out vertex V, um, just so you can see the visit order again. Right, and now we're going to loop through the neighbors of V. So we'll create a current pointer in order to loop through the linked list. Okay, so G, so it's that starts off at G edges V. Right now we're gonna loop through this list. Okay, so I'm going to grab the vertex from the linked list node, right, vertex V, vertex W, I mean. And now if W hasn't been visited yet, so if not visit W, then we're going to recurse on W. 
Okay, and that's it. So that's how simple recursive DFS is. All right, and let's print out a new line at the end. And let's remember our function prototypes. Okay, so now we'll compile, well, not yet. I'm going to edit this so that we are performing a DFS. Okay, so DFS starting from zero. And if we compile this now and run it, right, we get the vertices 01532. So let's check if this matches. Right, 01532. Then 47896. Right, 47896. Okay, so we get the same order. And now let me show you the backtracking behavior because that's really cool. Um, so. Remember the backtracking happens when the function returns right back to a previous instance of the function. All right, so what I'll do is after this recursive call returns, right, I'm going to print out V again, right, to indicate that we're coming back to V. All right, so, all right, so I'm just adding this print statement here to demonstrate the backtracking. Okay, and what does this give us? So, so what we're expecting is that it's gonna print out zero, one, five, three, two, and then once we backtrack to three, it's gonna print three again, and then four, seven, eight, nine, and then it should print out eight, seven, four, three, five, as we are backtracking, okay? So let's see if that happens. Test graph. Okay, now here is the, um, you know, path with backtracking, right? So 0, 1, 5, 3, 2, right? So 0, 1, 5, 3, 2. Then it prints out 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, right? So it's backtracking to 3, 4, 7, 8, 9. Then it backtracks, you know, 8, 7, 4, 3, 5, 8, 7, 4, 3, 5. Then it goes to 6, right? Then it backtracks to 5, 1, 0, okay? 5, 1, 0. Cool. So, so that's really cool, right? Uh, DFS. Okay, so what's the time complexity of recursive DFS? So it's also O of V plus E, right? If we use the adjacency list representation, right? And why? It's because of the same reason um, why BFS was O of V plus E, right? Each vertex is visited at most once. Right, so each function, um, so the function is called on each vertex at most once, right, so that's going to be O of V. And also for each vertex, we consider all of its edges once, which contributes O of E to the time complexity. So in total, um, the time complexity is big O of V plus E, okay? Cool, so that is recursive DFS. Now, how do we actually use recursive DFS to find if there is a path um, between two vertices? Because at the moment, all we're doing is recursing uh, or traversing from a starting point and just printing out the visit order. Right, so how do we actually use this to find if there is a path? So what we can do is just modify it slightly, right? So we're going to make our function take in the source vertex and the destination, right? And here's the recursive idea, right? So if the source is equal to the destination, right? Then that means there is a path, right? And so that should be fairly obvious, right? If the starting point is the destination, then there is a path. And that's our base case right, for our function. Right now, here's the recursive case, and this is an interesting one. Right? For each neighbor of source, right? So for each vertex that the source vertex has an edge to, we recursively check if there is a path from that vertex to the destination. Right? So 
if there is a path from any of our neighbors to the destination, then that means there is a path right, from the source to the destination. Right. So, so that's really nice. And um, to demonstrate that, here is an example. So we'll go over to here. Right, so suppose we want to check if there's a path from 0 to 7. Okay. So what we're going to do? So we're going to, well, first of all, we are trying to check if there's a path from 0 to 7, right? But we are doing this recursively. So I'm showing the core stack again on the right. Okay, so now 0 has, so we'll mark 0 as visited again. But now 1 is a neighbor of 0. So what we'll do is we'll check if there's a path from 1 to 7, all right? So we're recursing into 1 here and checking if there's a path to seven. What do we do now? Well, one has a neighbor five, so we'll check if five has a path to seven. Right, so we recurse into five. Now five has a neighbor three, so we'll recursively check if three has a path to seven. Right, so we recurse into three. And now, um, since we have two neighbors here, we'll pick two because two is lower. Okay, so two has not been visited. So now we'll check if there is a path from two to seven. Right now, this is where we actually hit a dead end, right? Because uh, both of two's neighbors have already been visited. Right? So what we actually do is we return false from this function. Right, but this doesn't mean that there isn't a path from 0 to 7 or from 2 to 7. That just means that in order to actually get to 7, we need to go back through another vertex that we've already visited. Right, so we just sort of backtrack from there and look at a different path. Right, so we backtrack to 3. Now 3 has another neighbor, which is 4. So we're going to recurse into that. Right, so recurse into 4. Now we want to check if there's a path from 4 to 7. Right, now 4 has an um, edge to 7, so we recurse into 7. Right, and now 7 is equal to 7, so our source is equal to our destination. Right, so that's our base case. So now we return true, right, because there's a path from 7 to 7, and that means there's a path from 4 to 7, Right, so we return true. That means there's a path from 3 to 7. That means there's a path from 5 to 7. That means there's a path from 1 to 7. And finally, that means there's a path from 0 to 7. Right, and we are done. Okay, so really nice application of DFS here. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so here is just the finished products and the edges that we ended up traversing right and let's actually implement this uh, because it is very interesting so okay so what I'll do is oops, I'll just create another function here okay so bool DFS find path Right, and we're taking in the graph, the starting vertex, and the destination. Okay, and now, well, first of all, we need to create a visited array. Right, so just like with normal DFS, uh, so calloc g and v size of bool. Okay, and now we're going to call our recursive helper function. So results equals DFS finds path recursive. So call our helper function. The helper function takes in the graph, the source and destination vertices, and the visitor array. Right, and then we free our visitor array, and then we return our results. Okay, now what do we do in our helper function? So graph G, vertex V, vertex destination, and visited. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, 
first thing we do in our function is check if our vertex is equal to our destination, right? If the current vertex is equal to the destination, that means there is a path, so we return true. Okay, now what we're gonna do afterwards is mark v as visited, because remember we've gotta make sure that we don't go around in cycles. And then we look at all the neighbors of v, right? So that means we have to loop through our adjacency list so g edges v, All right? And now we loop through this list just like we have a few times before. All right? Now let me grab the vertex from the list node. All right? Vertex w equals current v. And now, if v hasn't been visited, uh, sorry, w hasn't been visited. I'm going to call the function on w recursively, and if there is a path from w to the destination, then that means there is a path from v to destination. All right, so what do we do? DFS find path back g w destination. So we pass all of these in. And if there is a path from w to the destination, then that means we return true. Now, if we go, if we've gone through all of our neighbors and none of them have a path to the destination, then we return false at the end. Okay. So, yeah. So let me just grab this function, put a prototype, and take this function and. Let's see, test graph. Okay, so where is my function prototype going to go? Okay, it's going to go over here. Okay, so now let's um, call the function. Right, so if there is a path, so DFS find path, and let's try and find a path from zero to seven, right? Just like in our slides example. Okay, so if there is a path, then we print out there is a path from zero to seven. Otherwise, we'll print out no path from zero to seven. All right, so let's compile and run it. Is there a path from zero to seven? Yes, there is. Okay. Cool, so yeah, that's how we check if there is a path, right? But what if we wanna find if there is a path, right? Cause, um, sorry, what if we wanna actually find the path? Um, then we can do that too. Right, so here was the pseudocode for path checking. We're now, yeah, so path checking with recursive DFS, that's also gonna be big O V plus E, right? Because we're just modifying our DFS here slightly. Right, but what if we actually wanted to find the path? Um, then we can still use our predecessor array. Right, we can just create a predecessor array and then record the predecessor as we go through the DFS, okay? And then we trace backwards through the path after the DFS. Um, so, um, yeah, so here's our find path function, right? So instead of creating our visit array this time, we are creating a predecessor array, right? And then we call our recursive helper function, right? DFS find path and then we print out the path in reverse, right? right? And here's our helper function, right? So the helper function is going to first check our base case, right? So if V is equal to our destination, then there is a path, so we return true. Otherwise, for each neighbor um, of the current vertex, 
if the vertex hasn't been visited yet, then we set its predecessor to V, right, which is our current vertex, and then we recurse into that vertex. Right? And if there is a path, then we return true. Right? Otherwise, at the end, we return false. Okay, and um, so here is an example. So if we wanted to find a path from zero to seven again, and we ran our function, right, here is what we would get. Right, so we would get these predecessors. Right, so the predecessor of one would be zero, the predecessor of five would be one, the predecessor of three would be um, five, the predecessor of four would be three, and the predecessor of seven would be four. Okay. And the predecessor of two would be three, but two wouldn't be part of the path. Okay. And we can clearly see here that DFS doesn't guarantee that it's going to find us the shortest path, right? It's going, if there is a path, then it will find us one, but it's not always going to give us the shortest path, right? That's because it just chooses a vertex and goes to it. Um, it doesn't have any systematic way of exploring the vertices in order of distance, like BFS, right? With the BFS, we had a queue, which lets us store the vertices in order, right? With DFS, we don't do that. Okay, so that is how we can find the path with recursive DFS. Right? And let's try and implement this as well. It may as well. So what I'll do is I'll just edit what we already have. All right, so predecessor. So now I'm going to create a predecessor array instead of a visitor array. All right, I'm going to turn this function into a void function. Okay, and now um, I'm going to pass in the predecessor array instead of the visited array. So let's go over here and change that. Okay, so now, uh, so if we remember, if we go back to the pseudocode, right, so first of all, we have to set the predecessor of the vertex of the starting vertex to itself, just to mark it as visited. So, um, predecessor source equals source, or you could use both a visited array and a predecessor array. Um, but from before, we know that we can use a predecessor array as our visited array. So, predecessor of source equals source, and then we call our helper function. Okay, in our helper function, um, what we'll do is we'll go through our neighbors. Right now, for each neighbor, if we haven't visited that neighbor before, we're going to set its predecessor to V. So predecessor W equals V. Right, and pass in the predecessor array. Okay, and now we keep the same logic as, so actually, this needs to be changed, right? So if W hasn't been visited, so the way we check that now is we check the predecessor of W is minus one. Okay, and now um, that should be it, except I might need to change a couple of things. Let's change the prototype here. So int star predecessor. Right. And since we are trying to find the path here, let's print out the path after we call the function. So if there is a path, then we're going to print it out. Okay, so vertex current equals destination while current is not equal to the starting vertex. We're going to print out the current vertex. Right, and then backtrack. 
through the predecessor range. So current equals predecessor current. Right, then we'll print out the starting vertex at the end. Okay, and otherwise, let's just print out no path. at the end. So source list. And we free predecessor at the end. Okay, and let's see. So that should be it. So let me go to my test graph now and call just call DFS find path. So Right, and so I'll comment out all this stuff. Right, and this function here now doesn't return anything anymore. Okay, so now um, that should be it. So if I now run this, so it's gonna get a compiler error because I am so I have the wrong function prototype. So let me fix that real quick. Int star predecessor. So incompatible pointer. Oh yeah, so when we malloc our predecessor array initially, it's an int array. Okay, so compile that. Okay, now if we run it, we should get um, this path over here, right? 0, 1, 5, 3, 4, 7. All right, so let's run it. All right, and we get <laughs> uh, runtime error. So let's see. I think there is something here that I didn't malloc properly. So yeah, so I didn't malloc this array properly. So should be size of int, right? But helpful error message. So now if we compile and run it again, we should now get the, uh, what happened here? All right, so we get no path from zero to seven. Interesting. So there is a path from zero to seven, so. Let's see what happened here. So, okay, so, hmm. DFS, so we're calling DFS find path rec, passing source and destination. Anyway, I might figure this out later. Um, but yeah, so if we implement that properly, we should get um, a path 0, 1, 5, 3, 4, 7. Anyways, so, so that was recursive DFS, right? And now we can actually also implement DFS iteratively by right, using a loop, right? But there are a couple of differences, right? So the main one is that DFS uses a stack instead of a queue, okay? So if you look back to our BFS algorithm, it uses a queue, right? With the DFS, you would have to replace this with a stack. But there are also a couple more important differences. So actually mainly just one, uh, which is that DFS marks a vertex as visited after removing it from the stack, all right? So not when adding it, all right? So remember with BFS, we in, so we mark a vertex as visited when we enqueue it into the queue, right? At the same time as when we enqueue it. Um, with DFS, we mark a vertex as visited when we remove it from the stack. Okay, so here's the pseudocode. Right, so uh, notice that this is very similar looking to DFS, uh, sorry, to BFS, um, but we're using a stack here. Also, when we remove a vertex from the stack, that is when we mark it as visited. Right, so visited V equals true. Right, so that's the main difference here. And 
Um, and we'll leave this to the tutorial uh, to explore an example of this. Okay. Okay, so the analysis of either of the DFS is the same as VFS, right? So it's just O of V plus E uh, because of you know, similar reasons. So stack has O1 push and pop, and each vertex is visited at most once. Right? And also for each vertex, all of its edges are considered. So in total across all the vertices, that's going to be big O of E. Okay, so that's iterative DFS. Okay, so now for a couple of just extra concepts uh, to be wary about with graph traversal. So first of all, when we perform a graph traversal, right, uh, we are basically using certain edges right, during our traversal in order to get from one vertex to another. Right, so the edges that we actually used during the graph traversal actually form a spanning tree. Right, so if we take this graph that we've seen before and we do a BFS or DFS, we get a spanning tree. Right, so here is what we would get from a BFS. Right, and what this is saying is that uh, we used these edges from A to get to B, C, and D. Right, from B, we used this edge over here to get to E. We used this edge over here to get from E to F, and so on. Right, so that, that forms a spanning tree. And this is the spanning tree that we would get if we performed a DFS. Right, so we started at A, then we go from A to B, then to C, then to D, then to I. Right, so we went down as far as we could until we reached the dead end. Then we backtrack to C, right, from C, we take this edge to get to G, then to F, then to E, then we backtrack to G, then we went to F, and then to H. All right, so these are the spanning trees that we get. All right, so spanning trees. Another um, issue is what happens if the graph isn't connected, right, because... Um, we saw that BFS only visits the vertices in the same components, right? Only the vertices that can be reached from the source, right? So, right, so in this graph, all of the vertices were reachable from the source, but if there are a couple of extra vertices that were in a separate component, right, that are not connected at all to zero, then we wouldn't be able to visit them. Right. So example is this graph. Right here, if we start at zero, then we will end up visiting one, two, three, and four, and zero, but not the other vertices. Right. So if we do want to visit all of the vertices, then what do we do? Right. So the idea is to basically just perform a traversal on... So after we finish one traversal, Right, we find, we check if there are any vertices that haven't been visited yet. Right? So we pick one of those, and then we perform another traversal from that vertex. Right? And then we just keep doing this until all the vertices are visited. Right? And this produces a spanning forest. Right? So, so spanning forest is a term that we looked at in the last lecture. Okay? So that's what... Uh, happens if we have a disconnected graph and you want to traverse all of the vertices. Okay, so that is the pseudocode right, for that. So what are we doing here? So we are creating our predecessor array. Right? And now, instead of just calling the recursive helper function on a starting vertex, right, we actually use a loop and for each of the vertices, if the vertex hasn't been visited yet, which is, uh, so this is how we check it here, then we perform a DFS from that vertex, right? And here we're using DFS, but of course you could also use BFS if you want to. All right, so now since we have some extra time, let's see if I can go back and 
deal with this buggy code. Um, so what was our problem? So we create a predecessor array, right? And so we, we should initialize that to minus one really. So, you know, let's just do that. So initialize everything to minus one, and maybe that sh that maybe that's gonna fix it actually. Like, very interesting. So yeah, zero one five three four seven, right? So go back to here. Right. So here's the path we get zero one five three four seven, right? So there there we go. Simple fix. So yeah, that that is the that is it for our lecture. So. BFS and DFS. All right, and in the next lecture, we'll go through um, a couple of different graph problems and we'll see the power of DFS and how it lets us solve um, other kinds of problems, right? especially using its backtracking behavior. So, yeah, so I'll see you guys on Thursday.